Thank you, Joe, and hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be asked to uh, say a few words at the start of this session. Uh, I thought that um, I'd give a few remarks to introduce I squared. Uh, it seems that some events around the beginnings of the I squared and related uh, statistics, they're, they're long enough ago now, and I think I'm old enough to be indulgent and nostalgic that I thought I'd make a few notes, some historical notes to put uh, the talks into a, a bit of context. My life in meta-analysis began in the early 90s when I did my PhD with Anne Whitehead, pictured here, um, uh, on one of our annual department rambles at the University of Reading. Uh, my topic was random effects meta-analysis, so I was very interested in, in accounting for heterogeneity in various ways. Um, some early work I did, uh, which I never actually published as a paper, I did a little simulation study to look at the power of the test for heterogeneity in meta-analysis. And I think perhaps it's probably worth stating at the very beginning of this session, what I mean when I say the word heterogeneity in front of statisticians. So in meta-analysis, we have a number of studies. We, we assume each is estimating a, a quantity that's similar across studies, the same sort of conceptual parameter. Um, and the, all I mean by heterogeneity is that at least two of the studies have different underlying parameters theta i is not equal to theta j for two studies, i and j. And what became apparent to me and it has become apparent to many people over the years is that this test for heterogeneity has got some pretty poor properties in real applications. And more importantly, I think it just asks an, an interesting question. It's just not feasible that two studies will be estimating the same thing. Uh, so having this interest as background, and I'll come back to my thesis later, um, I took an opportunity when it came up to, to take a job with Simon Thompson and Doug Altman and John Deeks, who were PIs on a, an MRC grant around meta-analysis. Of course, Doug and John were co-conveners of the statistical methods group at the time, and they used this sort of research agenda to carve out a, a funded project. And within it was a aim to try and find a better way to measure heterogeneity. So we had lots of discussions and came up with some ideas. And one of them, which we thought might have some mileage, is something we called I squared. But you can look at it in two different ways, either as a kind of a, an easy to calculate statistic based on the usual test statistic and the number of studies, uh, which has a, a, an approximate interpretation, or as a, 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 a pseudo parameter. We're looking at the, the heterogeneity variance over the total variance. And so we, we put this forward. Interestingly, not many people know this, but uh, I originally stood for interclass correlation because of the similarity to the formula on the right to an interclass correlation coefficient in a, in a cluster randomized trial, drawing a link with something we're about to hear, hear about. I now uh, say and pretend that it stands for inconsistency. So that's how I think the best way to think about it is. Anyhow, about 20 years ago, we took this to the Cock and Cloakum in Lyon, and I've dug out just a picture of me with a couple of friends there, uh, but the slides that I presented there. And here's the conclusion that we came to is that essentially I squared or something much like it should be presented in Cochrane reviews in preference to the test. Uh, so we hoped that it would get taken up. Little did we predict quite the extent to which it was embraced and adopted by not just Cochrane, but the whole world. And here's a list of the, the most cited papers in the in history of the Statistics Medicine, the journal, and we are by some margin the, the most highly cited paper. It's embarrassing really when other papers are about real statistics. Um, but so it's been very widely taken up as people know. But along with this has come a lot of uh, misuse and misunderstandings about it. And I put this picture up because well, that's Simon Thompson who I work most closely with on the project on the right as David Spiegelhaus on the left, of course, plowing this with wine. But next to Simon is Ian. And I very distinctly remember Ian White knocking on my door in the unit and saying, after I presented it um, at a, a seminar, he said, you know, you, you said this it measures the extent of heterogeneity. It doesn't. It measures the impact of heterogeneity. And while I kind of knew that, it wasn't until that moment that it really dawned on me that we need to really explain that it's not a measure of the amount of heterogeneity, because that's what Tor squared does. And, and people have repeatedly mis misinterpreted it as a measure of the amount of heterogeneity when it is not. So we, we've tried to write more about this and, and with Michael Bornstein and others, there's a, a whole paper about exactly this one notion. 
So that's one of the big problems with I squared. The other big problem is, of course, people overinterpret it. And we've 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 presented thresholds in the Cochrane Hammer, but well, we haven't. We've said thresholds are misleading, so we give overlapping intervals. But people take these intervals completely out of context, and they miss the very very important words that we put above and below them. That apart from them being widely misleading, these are intended for randomized trials. And we'll see how, how it works in, in some other situations later in the morning, in, in the session. And we also have said that some other issues are just as important, the magnitude and direction and expressions of uncertainty uh, falling on deaf ears, it seems to a large extent. Anyhow, the main reason I mentioned my PhD at the beginning is because of another piece of work that came out of it. Um, I took a trip to Cambridge in the middle of my work and met with a, a younger David Spiegelhalter uh, to talk about Bayesian meta-analysis. And I wanted to know what prior distributions are used. And he made a very, very interesting comment. Say, well, you should use data to derive your prior. So I went back and um, um, worked on creating an empirical prior distribution, which became part of another chapter in my thesis. I went to the library, I photocopied about 30 meta-analysis data sets um, in gastroenterology, and I went back to my office and I pulled out the numbers and I formed a prior and saw what happened. And, and lo and behold, it, it helped us improve our inferences, so we thought. But I thought, well, we could do a lot better than randomly picking 30 meta-analyses just because they had gastroenterology in the title. And so some years later, when uh, we got another MRC grant, this time I was PI, um, and, we, and we wanted to look much more broadly and carefully at this question. So we took not 30, but nearly 15,000 meta-analyses from Cochrane and formed the empirical dist prior distribution from those. And this is the work that Becky Turner has, uh, has, has been, been leading on. And of course, it spawned a whole series of papers about empirical evidence on heterogeneity and putting them into Bayesian meta-analyses, which was the whole idea of this. But if you look at the actual distributions that we came out with, they really don't seem particularly uh, appropriate. Look at these very, very high values of heterogeneity parameters. These are tor squares for log odds ratios. These are huge values that are just not plausible. So I very much welcome um, further attempts to, to get empirical distributions that really do reflect the amount of heterogeneity we expect to see in the meta-analyses we do. So a few remarks that I think links to all of the presentations we've, we've had. As you can tell, this is not my work, it's joint work with lots of people. I'm particularly indebted to the Medical Research Council's funded a lot of my work and to Cochrane, the Statistical Methods Group and all these collaborators here. I'll stop there and thank you very much.